Welcome to Think Tank Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp, President of Sharp Research and Translation. My guest is Dr. James Corcoran, James R. Corcoran to be exact. Um, Dr. Corcoran is a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, he served in the U.S. Army uh, and retired as a colonel. Uh, he then went on and got a Ph.D. at uh, University of Hawaii. Today he is a professor at Hawaii Pacific University where he specializes in Asian affairs, particularly with a focus to China and Southeast Asia. Welcome to Think Tech Asia. Uh, thanks very much, Bill. I'm uh, happy to be here and uh, I'm happy that you're hosting. Both Thank of you. us having been Vietnam War veterans right. and both of us veterans of the early days of Taiwan in the early 70s That's true. while it was still a military dictatorship and having watched Taiwan proceed to the point where it is today. So we have a lot of uh, things in common for him. We certainly do. Thanks for inviting me. Well, you're quite welcome. It's my pleasure. Uh, speaking of Vietnam, uh, you've mentioned to me that you were recently back there. It was your first time after the war. Uh, I think you said there was a 46-year period interlude. <laughs> Bill, uh, it's a little embarrassing. Actually, uh, yeah, e even though I teach courses, on the 11 nations of Southeast Asia uh -huh. and the South China Sea, and I've been uh, in and out of all of those other nations. The only ones I haven't been to are Laos, and that was for particular domestic reasons, and Timor. Uh -huh. I haven't been to Timor, but I have avoided going back to Vietnam. I was with the 1st Infantry Division in Vietnam, 1967-68, the, the battles leading up to Tet and, mm. and afterwards. And uh, I, I've just avoided going back to Vietnam, but I was invited by the um, Vietnamese uh, Academy of Social Sciences and also Vietnam National University to attend conferences uh, uh, celebrating the Vietnamese victory over the French at Gien Bien Phu. It was the 60th anniversary. And uh, uh, I, I found that to be quite interesting, but uh, the big thing was that while I was there, the crisis over the Chinese placing uh, an oil rig within uh, Vietnamese uh, maritime boundaries uh, erupted. And uh, I feel fortunate that I was in regular contact with Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, individuals and with uh, academicians and with others uh, to be able to get their response on China's incursion and, uh, and to be able to get uh, a feel uh, in the streets and around the city in Hanoi and uh, other places as to uh, how people felt about this and what their re reaction and their response was. So it was very interesting and it kind of, I think, is a good lead into uh, uh, our discussion today of China, the 11 nations of Southeast Asia, and the South China Sea. Well, you certainly mentioned a lot there. Let's just go back there. Um, how did you, you said that you avoided going back to Vietnam. Yeah. Why? Well, okay, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, uh, I, uh, frankly, uh, uh, I just was not, uh, uh, during that period of time, really ready to turn around and face some of the, uh, uh, frankly, some of the remembrances mm -hmm. of my time uh, there. I think you understand, well, I understand because what you're saying. you had some of the same experiences. Right. Uh, I have to admit, I, 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 ha I had a little um, hesitation about going to Hanoi. Mm -hmm. You know, Hanoi, that's the enemy's capital. However, when I got there, I realized it's really quite a pretty city, and I enjoyed being there. Um, but I, I understand what you're saying. Um, uh, probably we have a little similarity, and that is, uh, I think, does your mind uh, often flip back to Vietnam? Uh, yeah, Bill, I've had uh, some experiences uh, with that sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can yeah. understand that. My mind often flips back to Vietnam. Yeah. Well, okay, so you got invited by um, the Foreign Minister, no, Academy of Social Sciences. The uh, Vietnamese Academy of Social Sciences and the Vietnamese National University. Okay. Their University on um, uh, uh, Humanities and Social Sciences. Mm -hmm. Two conferences okay. celebrating the 60th anniversary 
of the uh, Viet Minh victory over the French at, at the Battle of Yem Yem Phu. Was this a whole, uh, how should we say, assortment of foreign scholars, plus the It, it was a world-level, a worldwide conference. We, we even had one professor from the Ukraine. Is that right? And it was actually uh, somewhat electrifying because after she gave her presentation, she made the statement because Russia had already made taken the Crimea and right, had made their right. incursion into the East Ukraine. Mm -hmm. She said, uh, this conference is very important and the subject is very important. And if I had my wish, the, my people of Ukraine would pay more attention to this. Mm -hmm. In other words, the idea of uh, foreign incursion and, of course, uh, the parallel would be the French trying to recolonize Vietnam right. after the end after of World, World War II. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Yeah. It was very exciting, I right. can tell you. Now, um, okay, now you said you, you had a chance to sort of mix it up with the, um, how should we say, the, the man on the street. Yes, right. That must have been pretty interesting. Can you tell us? You know, well, uh, a, a, a conversation, a bit of a conversation or two you might have had. Fortunately, you've been to Hanoi, uh -huh. and um, in the best French tradition, they have coffee shops. Right. And it's a great place to meet people right. and to talk with people. Right. And, um, and so just in uh, going to some of those places, uh, kind of relaxing, you know, in between sessions of the conference or after the conference and uh, able to hear what they're saying. Right. Uh, I don't understand Vietnamese, but uh, I was able then to engage them uh, in, in the English language uh -huh. and, and get their idea about. Uh, frankly, it, it, for those who are not in government or the military, it seemed to me, because I had access to both uh -huh. during the conferences, right. it was over a week, right, right. Um, uh, they, they at that point were not too sure of exactly what it all meant with the Chinese setting up their oil rig mm. within the maritime boundaries, within the 200-mile ex ex exclusive economic zone, mm. and a violation of, uh, of, of Vietnam's sovereignty, right, and right. really a challenge and a test to Vietnam mm. made by the PRC, the People's Republic of China. But uh, also I was interviewed by uh, TV uh, outlets and radio and print and uh, wanting to know uh, uh, first of all, uh, about what I was doing at the conference and what I thought uh, about Dien Bien Phu and all of that, but also what I thought about the uh, Chinese setting up their oil rig there off the coast. So it was interesting in that regard. Okay, now you said two more really interesting things there. They asked you what you thought about Dien Bien Phu. Yeah. What did you tell them? Well, uh, my paper actually, w uh, I think, was interesting to them. But, uh, they had asked me if I would, because my primary area is mainly in China, Chinese mm -hmm. modern history. Right. My degree is in Chinese modern history. Okay. So they asked me if I would do a, a Chinese view of Dien Bien Phu and the follow-on uh, uh, conference in, in, uh, in Switzerland. Follow-on so, conference? Yeah, oh, in yeah. Switzerland. Oh. Yeah. And so, uh, and so I did that. and. Uh, and uh, they, they were quite interested, even though we had two uh, scholars from China, from uh, two universities, uh, of course, uh, in the South, because they're, they're closer to Vietnam, so they're more uh, interested in studying Vietnam. Uh, they, want, they asked if I would do my paper on that. So the, the idea, uh, my idea was, first of all, uh, that the, uh, uh, the Viet Minh, uh, led by General Vo Nguyen Zha, mm. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, Ho Chi Minh was the, the leader of the, the party at the time. And Two titanic the figures. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, frankly, I mean, uh, the, the the Vietnamese performed heroically in this battle against the French forces, the French field forces, 150 miles west of Hanoi. Mm -hmm. um, part, I think, maybe part of the issues I might have had with the Vietnamese is that. Uh, I stressed that it was that Chinese support and assistance uh, during that battle, uh, advice and materiel support, weaponry, for example, cannons and those kinds of things with which they used to beat the French at Dien Bien Phu. Mm. Uh, without those things, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the, the victory at Dien Bien Phu was, was largely attributable 
to the Chinese support and, and mm. advice. Mm. And I'm not sure that that's exactly what the Vietnamese wanted to hear. <laughs> and, then, and, then the, and then the other thing was that, um, uh, that uh, in my research, and, and I, I had actually found top secret communication between Zhou Enlai from Geneva uh, and Mao and Liu Xiaoqi wow. in, in, in China. Uh, at, with Zhou Enlai giving updates about how the, the, the Geneva Conference on Vietnam was going, uh, the Indochina War was going, and, and what he planned to do next and what they thought. And um, that, with uh, researching that sort of material, my findings were that uh, China, the People's Republic of China, had, had not browbeaten or forced Vietnam into making the decision to uh, uh, split uh, Vietnam at the 17th parallel, mm. as was done at that conference. Mm. However, uh, the Vietnamese uh, take on that is that it was China. The, if they had had their, uh, their druthers, they would not have uh, agreed to a division of Vietnam at the 17th parallel with a separate government in the south and, uh, and uh, uh, the S uh, uh, SRV in the north. And um, and so I think that's another thing that the Vietnamese they 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 would have rather that I had not come upon that finding. So. I, I remember we talked about this, and it was my recollection that it was actually Stalin that put pressure on the Vietnamese to divide it at the 17th parallel. Say like, well, okay, we don't want to go too far with this. We don't want to antagonize people too much. You've got a pretty good chunk of the country. Be happy. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, uh, that, that part is debatable, too. We d I don't think we really know the extent that mm. Stalin was able to influence that. Mm. And uh, this, this was a really, you could say, uh, Zhou Enlai's first uh, significant appearance on the world di diplomatic scene. Mm. And, and, and he was very uh, um, uh, self-sufficient in deciding uh, uh, things that would happen, policies, uh, uh, that would be taken, and also uh, uh, arranging for um, uh, separate talks between different differing parties. Mm. Uh, and so, I, I, my research shows that, uh, of of course, Stalin's uh, desires were taken into consideration. But uh, frankly, uh, I don't think that it was an influencing factor mm. in the decision to mm. to split at the 17th parallel. It's kind of like if you remember the Xi'an incident, sure. where the, the, the nationalist, Chinese Nationalist Party, Chinese Communist Party coalition mm -hmm. as Xi'an in uh, December of 1936. Uh, many don't know, Stalin had sent a, a telegram to the Chinese Communist leaders who were part of negotiating a settlement right. to, for a united front. And he, and he recommended that they blame the Xi'an incident on the Japanese. <laughs> and that way uh, they could uh, move toward a united front and at the same time they could weaken uh, uh, the uh, Japanese strategic advantage uh, mm. by doing that. And, and he was ignored. Mm. Uh, they didn't do that. So, mm. and, and that was way, way earlier in 1936. So right. you can imagine by 1954. Uh, so, uh, no, I don't think. Mm, that's, a, that's an interesting yeah. point. Yeah. Well, um, you, you spent your time in Hanoi. Did you go to any in other Hanoi, places? Yeah, yeah, all all in Hanoi. Yeah. All in Hanoi. At the universities. At the university. Okay. And the Lan Vien Hotel. I have to put in a plug. A four star hotel, uh, right near the major lake in central Hanoi. Um, a wonderful place to stay. Uh -huh. And the other thing about I I I was just really overwhelmed by the courtesy and the hospitality, and the warmth uh, of my reception, across the board from arriving at the airport and uh, being in Hanoi and all different parts of Hanoi and at the universities and coming out of the airport. They were did, just wonderful. Did the Vietnamese knew, know that you were a Vietnam veteran? That's a very interesting thing, too, that you bring that up. And uh, uh, my discussions, uh, first of all, uh, they, uh, they were particularly um, ad admiring of the fact that I had actually fought in the war in the South. Mm -hmm. And kind of, you may know this, but kind of the general uh, atmosphere in Vietnam now is 
that the Vietnamese uh, war vets and the American war vets are coming closer to, and closer together mm. and are sharing their uh, experiences um, mainly because uh, their feeling is we are military people, we fought this war and civilians won't understand this. We have to go to a commercial break now. Oh, we so do we're already. We're going to come so back to this uh, as soon as we as we as soon as we come back. Okay. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm host of uh, Hawaii: The State of Clean Energy, which is our flagship show, which plays 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. And the uh, the supporters of that show are uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and uh, Hawaii Energy. And luckily enough, we have representatives of both of them right here today to tell you more about what they think about the show. Uh, Sharon Moriwaki at my left is uh, co-chair of Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and she goes first. Sharon? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I'm so glad that we have this Hawaii, the state of clean energy. This was uh, two years ago when we started this, and we have continued it because it's so important, and there's so many developments happening across the state. And we hope you'll tune in every Wednesday, 4 to 5. It's wonderful. And uh, Ray is uh, Hawaii Energy. Ray, what is your thought about the same subject? Well, I, I agree completely with Sharon uh, that uh, we are talking about every Wednesday, 4 to 5, uh, we talk about some of the most important subjects that uh, are affecting the islands uh, now and into the future. Uh, energy, clean energy, we need it. Uh, we often run into uh, new ideas that we had not uh, thought about before. Uh, we did just today, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think we're going to have more of that uh, in the future. So uh, come on down and, uh, and watch us uh, 4 to 5 on Wednesdays, um, and we'll uh, see what happens. We'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha. Hi, my name is Seymour Kazimersky. I have a show called Seymour's World on ThinkTech Hawaii. Our show is about opening minds and facilitating conversations. To tell you the truth, I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. I have no idea who our guests are going to be. But I guarantee you we're going to have lots and lots of fun. Aloha from Seymour's World. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I host a show called Healthcare in Hawaii here on ThinkTech. We get together once a week or sometimes uh, twice a month. Depends. When we're busy, we get together less often. But we love to see you here to talk about the preeminent healthcare issues in our state. Our programs vary very widely. We talk about economics, we talk about health care, we talk about social issues on this program. Thanks for joining us. Well, welcome back to Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, my guest today is Dr. James R. Corcoran. Uh, he's a faculty member at Hawaii Pacific University. He specializes in Chinese history. He also has very extensive uh, knowledge and experience in Southeast Asia. And he was recently invited to Vietnam by the uh, Vietnamese Academy of Social Sciences. And we've been talking about uh, his trip back to Vietnam. Uh, first time he had been back to the country after serving there in the military uh, in 1967 to 1968. And uh, I, I think we'll, we'll take up where we left off. Uh, you, you know, it, it, as you were speaking, it made me think when I was back in Vietnam in, 19, in 2000, and talking to a lot of the young Vietnamese, I, I mentioned sort of like sheepishly, sheeplessly, sheeplessly, yeah, you know, hesitatingly. <laughs> well, I was here during the war, <clears throat> you know, in the army, and they said, oh yeah, how about that? <laughs> and um, then they went, uh, they went out and wanted to ask about them. What's MTV like in America, or yeah. something like that? Yeah. I mean, the war is just like they're totally uninterested in that. That's like ancient history to them. <laughs> well, it is for our young people also. Yeah, well, that's true which too. Which is why we teach it at Hawaii Pacific University. <laughs> right. yeah. That and other wars, you know, that these uh. are being forgotten. Uh, and and yeah, I, I had the same experience with. Uh, with the uh, the younger generation, but mm. with the older generations, it, it it was something kind of new where uh, they have put into place this idea of 
American vets and Vietnam vets sharing their experiences. Mm. And there are veterans groups now going there, American mm. veterans groups going there. Uh, this great book, uh, uh, They uh, Marched uh, Into Sunlight mm. by David Marinus, mm. actually takes the Vietnamese commander of the Battle of uh, Long Nguyen Secret Zone mm. and the 1st Infantry Division and one of the American commanders, and they, he takes them to the battlefield. This is where uh, the 2nd and the 28th uh, 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 Infantry Battalion was virtually wiped out. Um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Terry Allen, the son of the great Terry Allen who commanded the 1st Infantry Division in World War II, mm. was killed in that battle mm. against the 9th uh, VC Regiment with four battalions against an undermanned American battalion. Mm. So uh, so when you read that book, uh, they, 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 they go through the reminiscences, reminiscences and what you find is the American commander who survived the battle and the Vietnamese commander, uh, 9th Infantry Division uh, Regiment commander, uh, uh, drew very, very close and, and, be, and became uh, emotionally uh, very close to each other. Mm. So this kind of thing I also found in, in Hanoi uh, with uh, people who had, you know, been around during the war, had experienced mm. the war. You know, I've, I've read, I think, three um, of this type of book. These were books written by Vietnamese, North Vietnamese uh, veterans of the Vietnam War, written in Vietnamese, smuggled out of the country, translated into English. They're really very interesting. And they talk about a disappointment. They said, well, you know, we spent 10 years in the South. You know, in pretty primitive living conditions. Harsh conditions. And, you know, with the idea that this would all help the country and it would be a better country, and then when we came home, uh, things would be so much better. And then when we came home, uh, went back north, you know, we were really disappointed. Things weren't better. They had no promise of being better. Um, it, it seems like they were to some degree spurned by society, and, and they were totally frustrated. And it was really interesting reading those, those books. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think they were very motivated when they were in the South and yeah. the war, uh, fighting for national honor, fighting against imperialism, uh, trying to create a better tomorrow. And then when it was over, yeah, there was victory. But it, the, the, the joy of victory was short-lived. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty eye-opening. Uh. Yeah, I think the important thing about the Vietnam War especially is uh, your view of the war and afterwards depended on who you were and where you were. And each place is different and each level of participation is different. Right. Yeah. I think that's important. Right. These these um, authors, I, I, you know, all were pretty much in the thick of things. Mm -hmm. um, they they weren't on the sidelines. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's very very interesting. Um, well, now, okay, you're there at a, a kind of a tense time. The Chinese have moved this oil drill into yeah. Vietnam's e EZ. I guess right. it was. Right. Right. And the Vietnamese didn't take that well. I think it's interesting to remind our viewers that Vietnamese history <laughs> is is largely colored about confrontation with China. Exactly. And so many, it always, I, I'm always astounded by the fact that so many streets in Vietnam are named after one national hero or another who beat back the Chinese. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And beginning with the Trung sisters in 39 AD. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, so it was, that's one street after another after heroes. another. The Chinese, uh, the Vietnamese were occupied basically by uh, Chinese various dynasties for a thousand years, 181 BC in the Han Dynasty up to three, uh, 939 uh, uh, AD uh, in the end of the Tang. So, right. so they have that experience, and uh, right. and and the the what I found, which I think is quite interesting, which actually did surprise me, um, in the universities. Uh, there was really very little evidence of any significant Chinese study program 
in either of the universities. Really? That really surprised me. That's uh, shocking. And, and, and you may have noticed around Hanoi, basically uh, uh, references to China and things Chinese have pretty much been eliminated. You don't see stores, you don't see signs, you certainly don't see Chinese characters uh, on signs. And at the universities, uh, and when I inquired about it, what the various professors told me was, oh, the younger generation is be here in the universities are becoming increasingly interested in Chinese studies. And so now we're beginning to uh, approach setting up uh, mm. Chinese studies uh, uh, departments and, and, and opportunities. And so it was, it was quite interesting to me in the fact that they asked me, uh, a Howley guy, yeah. uh, to, to, to provide China's view of the Battle of Gamian Fu and the follow on Geneva Conference. Mm. It was kind of interesting to me. And I, I was not able to find uh, uh, China scholars who I could engage with, speak, you know, Putonghua, Mandarin, Putonghua. With, and, and, and exchange views with. And so I, I think that's very interesting. Now, I have a very narrow slice of experiential uh, time there, so I, I can't say that this is across the board. But the Vietnamese Academy of Social Sciences and the Viet Vietnamese National University are, you know, the, really the two top in, in, in Hanoi, right. in the north. Um, yeah, that, that's, um, uh, you, you made me think of a couple of things you were, when you were talking about that. Um, when they say Chinese studies, are they talking about mainland China or Taiwan? Oh, they're talking, they're talking about mainland China, yeah. Be here's the reason why I ask, because there are a lot of Taiwanese investments in Vietnam. Oh, yeah. Huge amount. <laughs> and I know that um, there are um, folks that go to Taiwan for training. Because uh -huh. I've been on China Airlines flights from Hanoi to mm -hmm. Taipei, mm -hmm. full of these trainees. Yes, there are that are going to train um, in, t in factories in Taiwan. I think what you will find, uh, however, is that most of that activity is in the south. And I, think I didn't go to the true. south. I, was I in think the that's north. probably true. And I was in Hanoi. Yeah. And so uh, I, think that's uh, true. I, I think you could maybe shed more light on that. But the, uh, the, the presence of Chinese activity, whether uh, China, Taiwan, or mainland China, the two Chinas, uh, the president. <laughs> I don't care if you like it or not. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Taiwan. I, it is, doesn't bother me, but there are certain people in Beijing that will probably bother. <laughs> oh well, uh, 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 let's talk about it. You know? So what I'm saying is that you may find more. Uh, remember that uh, in the aftermath of the oil rig crisis, where the Chinese set up the oil rig in Vietnamese territorial waters, uh, there was popular uprising, and they right. actually uh, uh, invaded and, and wrecked uh, Chinese factories. Most of those were in the south. Taiwanese. And it's interesting, yeah. it's interesting that they didn't differentiate between Taiwanese factories and mainland factories, uh, that both were attacked equally. I've heard that there is actually a pretty chummy relationship between Vietnam and Taiwan. Um, and, and the folks that have been sent there to be the, you know, uh, head of the, the Vietnamese version of TECO, and the people with lots of experience, uh, various kinds. And, um, um, and a reasonable exchange of information and that sort of thing, which would seem to make sense. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's very, very, very interesting. Um, China on one side, Taiwan on the other. Where, where you might uh, have a potential for a conflict of interest, of course, is in the South China Sea. Yeah. Because, as you know, uh, Taiwan uh, claims that same, it's called the Nine Dash Line. Right. It's called that because that's how the, on the map, the border is delineated with right. nine dashes. Right. And uh, this was established uh, in my research. I have the one of the, I have the original map that John Kai Shek used there, right? to establish oh. a copy of the oh. original map that John Kai Shek, you uh, nationalist leader, in 1947. Now here, John Kai Shek was in the middle of a civil okay. war in which he was actually going to lose his country, and yet he's 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 making this claim to the South China Sea. 
We're and coming up uh, on what our I second found out, here. what I found out in my research is the reason he did it is because at that time the French were busy moving into claims in the South China Sea, and Chiang Kai-shek wanted to uh, forestall the French from expanding into any area in the South China Sea, and that's the reason he did it. So what you have today is that the the Vietnamese National People's Congress has extended their claim in the South China Sea almost all the way over to the east, to the, to the, to, to the coast of the Philippines. Meanwhile, the Chinese, uh, their claim goes uh, all the way down uh, just off the coast, as you know, of, of, uh, Brunei. of Borneo, yeah. uh, uh, Brunei, and uh, uh, just short of Natuna, the Natuna Island group, which belongs to Indonesia. Right. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, the Philippines now, uh, the president of the Philippines, uh, Benigno Aquino, uh -huh. uh, has, has passed a, a law through the, their uh, parliament that it, it, it's now called the, um, the Philippines, the West Philippine right. Sea, right. instead of the South China Sea. Of course, Malaysia and Indonesia, it's Laut China Selatan, uh, South China Sea still. And of course, the Vietnamese have, they call it the East Sea, right. instead of the South China Sea. Let's take a break here, and okay. we'll come back and pick okay. this up. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel, CEO of ThinkTech. On Thursday, December 11th, we're having our annual reunion party. We call it Think Tech United. It's at the Lania Kea YWCA. Uh, it's for our speakers and hosts and moderators and friends. Uh, please come down. Everybody is invited to be united. We'll see you there. Check our website for details. Aloha. Um, yeah, the, um, of course, you know, on the other hand, what I was saying that in, in some respects, I, I've heard that, uh, you know, the relationship between Taiwan and Vietnam is, is reasonably chummy. Of course, some things have happened lately um, have uh, dismayed the Vietnamese. Um, Taiwan is really building up Ita Apa, uh, Taiping Island, building docks there that could accommodate some of the larger ships they have, having live fire drills, and apparently this has sent the Vietnamese through the roof. Um, so I, I don't know uh, I, um, uh, what the long-term impact will be on Taiwan-Vietnamese relations. Uh, Taiwan certainly needs all the friends it can get. and. Um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, uh, that's one uh, uh, of, uh, of controversy right there because uh, the Vietnamese do claim uh, Itu Aba uh, the, in Chinese Taiping Island. Taiping, right. Taiping right. And, uh, and this, this uh, interestingly enough, in all of the islands in the South China Sea, there, most of them are just atolls. Rocks. Many of them are <laughs> just a few feet above sea level. But this is the one place that has its own natural water supply. Mm any of the other islands, water mm. has to either be manufactured or brought mm. in. And, uh, and uh, they have an airstrip which is uh, nearly a mile long that they built there uh, and that to accommodate uh, modern uh, uh, military aircraft. And also they have completed uh, their port facilities to right. where they can bring uh, logistics uh, right. support and uh, military support into uh, so uh, the key for Taiwan is that um, uh, because uh, at least through 2016, 80 percent of China's uh, mainland China's energy uh, of flow will be across the South China Sea. Right. And right. the idea is if a conflict breaks out, I think you and I have talked about this because I had talked to uh, Taiwan Ministry of National Defense personnel. Right. Uh, if conflict breaks out, one of the strategies of Taiwan would be to try and sever that uh, vital uh, flow of energy that into makes, mainland yeah. China, and it would greatly weaken China. And so that's very important. And the, the whole contest, as you know, over the South China Sea, it's not really the land features, which are very small and insignificant. It, the resources underneath mm. uh, the, uh, the surface of the ocean. Uh, oil and natural gas, especially, but also mineral, and also seafood. Sovereignty. Yeah. 
well, well, it, it's not a claim of sovereignty so much as it is uh, scrambling to get uh, to get these resources. Right. You see? Right. Uh, that's and, and also seafood, very very important to these nations. Right. And uh, the availability of uh, fish and, and uh, other uh, forms of seafood is is uh, is diminishing mm -hmm. in the South China Sea. There's going to be increasing competition over that increasing competition over oil and natural gas and then of course uh, these uh, 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 these sea routes that are very important both uh, for commercial use over half of all world commercial traffic passes across the South China that Sea every yeah. year and the military uh, access in and out and across is also very important well also recently we we're talking about this earlier today the Chinese are creating a man-made island on which it seems they want to build an airstrip that can uh, accommodate very modern combat aircraft. That really throws a new twist into it, doesn't it? Yeah, that'll be their second one. They, they have also they have already built up Sansha mm -hmm. uh, Island, right? And they already have, uh, uh, but that is closer to uh, Hainan, closer to the coast of China. Right. But uh, what you're talking about is in the Paracel Islands, mm -hmm. Fiery Cross Island. Fiery called. Cross Island. And they are now building that. They're, they're building an island. Right. They're taking the uh, original atoll, and they're dredging, and they're building an island. And, and they are fixing to put uh, a, another uh, military-capable airstrip on so that So what island. do you think? Should the United States be upset about this? Should the United uh, States take some action? Should it just, well, well what's your take? Uh, the U.S. needs, I think, to place even closer attention uh, to the South China Sea. Uh, there's a, a direct clash between the United States and the People's Republic of China uh, concerning the South China Sea. Uh, and that clash is very important. Our policy in the United States is that uh, there should be equal access and unfettered access right. to all parts of the South China right. Sea. And China's claim is we don't have to pay attention to that, and and we don't agree. And China claims that that whole South China Sea for their own. So this is the the basic clash of interest uh, between the two nations. Mm. Uh, there's not much we can do short of actually application of force, mm. uh, because if China doesn't want to uh, work on a diplomatic level to try and resolve the issues, if China does not want to engage in, in, in working out some sort of a solution, such as equal sharing of the resources mm -hmm. in the South China Sea, then, uh, you know, what can be done? It's, it's the same situation with Putin in Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, however much we want to work with him and work this out and, and everything, if he doesn't want to work it out, then where do you go from there? Mm -hmm. And I think this is the same case with China. Mm -hmm. It seems to me they're going to be pretty unyielding on this. They are. They have been and are unyielding. They, they um, see this as a, there's not only the economic aspect, but also they see it as a defensive buffer. They, 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 they say, well, in the past we were assaulted from the sea by the foreigners, and they want to, in my view, they want to control the South China Sea to prevent that from happening. And at least that's what they say, as, as they do in the East China Sea. What's interesting about that, what I find very uh, important about that is uh, Communist China is now reinforcing a claim that was laid in by the their nationalist. enemy, Nationalist <laughs> China, in 1947. Uh, you know, that, 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 that's paradoxical, you know? Well, you know, I've been doing some um, investigation uh, about a month ago or so uh, on this, um, and, and looking into the, like, the, the Taiwan perspective and both from the point of view of the DPP, uh, of the Democratic Progressive Party, as well as the KMT. Um, there's some ideas floating around the Democratic Progressive Party, which I don't think they're going to enunciate too much before a big election this Saturday. Yeah. But there, there's, there's think groups within the DPP that are talking about, well, maybe we should give up our claims in the South China Sea. We'll hold on to the process of Dongshan. And we'll hold on to Taiping, because these are pretty significant land masses. But you know what? We kind of would like to talk to these other countries and work out some kind of mutually acceptable solutions. And we're into UN clause. We're into codes of conduct. UN clause, the UN, uh, UN, um, UN uh, conventional, uh, conventional law of the law sea. Of the sea yeah. And 
You know, at the same time, I, I wonder if the KMT is not making a little bit of a movement in that area, too, where, you know, some of these, as you say, some of these are atolls. These are like <laughs> specks in the sea, right? And I've heard that there is maybe some, in this regard, the DPP is thinking, at least in some parts of the DPP, is, is probably ahead of the KMT. But there seems to be some suggestion in the KMT that they might be thinking about, well, let's go for land mass as a basis of claims rather than this blanket historical claim. Mm. But I don't think much is going to happen on this, certainly before this Saturday. And, you know, the 2016 election is not all yeah, that far away. And this exactly. is kind of tricky stuff yeah. because some people in the DPP will uh, say, hey, forget it. We're going to hold on to those. Yeah. We're not going to go anywhere on that. And then I, um, some people, I, I actually I talked to one well-known researcher that's more or less aligned with the uh, KMT, and his was very adamant. That's against Article 4 of the Constitution. <laughs> Article 4? Yeah, which lays out, uh, you know, the, um, territorial, territorial claims. Yeah. yeah. Well, one, one thing I think that's also important, uh, wouldn't uh, Taiwan uh, uh, receive and be very happy if they were able to extract oil from any area in oh, the South China Sea yeah. and natural gas? I mean, this is w the thing that Taiwan does not have now. Right. I mean, they, they have to import That's all the of their import. energy. Right. And, right. Uh, and I, I think that that would play a very important role besides strategic considerations. Uh, economic considerations would play a very important role. So I, I don't think anything significant is going to happen in regard to Taiwan claims of the South China Sea anytime soon. Well, it's true that President Ma is probably not in a position to make any big concessions on that. We, we've, we've got about four minutes left here. Mm. Um, got a big, as I said a couple times, got a big election coming up in Taiwan this yeah. Saturday, November 29th. Uh, any, any predictions? Well, uh, it, it, first of all, uh, this this is called the nine-in-one uh, election, where they're going to have nine different electional election procedures in one day, mm. and uh, uh, it's something new and something different. And it's going to be interesting to see how all that turns out. Right. The second thing is, if if we think, for example, that uh, uh, that uh, Taipei, the capital, is pretty much the reserve of the KMT, the Kuomintang Party, uh, then we see the current uh, uh, candidate uh, running for office, uh, Sean Lian, uh, that, uh, that there's, he's, he's quite well favored. Right. And what happens if uh, the KMT loses their stronghold uh, of Taipei? You know what I think? I think if, if the DPP and Co, the independent, if they yeah, Co, do really yeah. well in this election, it's going to bring in a new, whole new generation of KMT leaders. Uh, Ma is going to have to resign as yeah. party chair. Okay. Okay. He'll still be president, but he's only got two years left. Yeah. It could be the end of Lianzhan. Okay. Wang Jingping is probably not going to get reelected. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's going to bring in a new era of leadership. If, if the DPP really does well. Um, you know, I personally think that, uh, I, I personally would like to see Taiwan in the TPP. It's got some work to do. It's got to open up its economy more. But um, I really would like to see it, you know, um, get into the TPP. Of course, the U.S. has got to move the TPP ahead. I'm thinking now where the Republicans in control the Senate, uh, Obama wanting to be the Pacific president, maybe there's a chance of happening that. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping, and uh, actually I wish Taiwan well. I hope it does make it into the TPP. Uh, well, we're coming down here to kind of to the end. Um, do you, you have any kind of last-minute thoughts or predictions you'd like to share with us? Reflections? Uh, uh, the only thing, I, I guess, Bill, you and I having been involved uh, intimately in Asia for four decades now, uh, Pretty long haul it's when you very, think about very, it. Very, very yeah. interesting to see how these things are playing out compared to how things played out over that four-decade period. And, right. Uh, and uh, it's always great for me to get together with you and to share uh, these experiences with you. I have a course on Taiwan that's now scheduled for the summer, ah. and I definitely want to have you 
thank you very much. Be guest lecturer at that thank course. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate Taiwan. it. I always like to. Uh, I find Taiwan very interesting. That's that's an issue that's really enthused me since the early '70s. So uh, I, I'm always happy to talk about that. I'm losing my earpiece here. <laughs> and so. Um, Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us, and um, we'll see you again next week. Thank you for joining us again, and thank you to our...